there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Right. Hello, yes, um, I'm Karen Attar. I'm a research fellow at the Institute of English Studies of the University of London and the curator of rare books and university art at Senate House Library, which is the central library for all the colleges of the University of London. Might I mention that we have a full set of Kelmscott press books in our special collections, which everybody is like is very welcome to come and see, in addition to a fine set of other private press books from those which deliberately continued the traditions of the Kelmscott Press and others, and many examples of early printing, as well as lots of 19th century books which demonstrate very clearly what William Morris was objecting to when he wanted to create beautiful books. And now to Laura. Dr. Laura Cleaver is a senior lecturer in manuscript studies at the English Institute of English Studies at the University of London. She comes to us from Trinity College Dublin, where she lectured on medieval art, especially of the High Middle Ages. Now, a lot of manuscript scholars do have a background in art history and or a lot of art historians move into medieval manuscripts, however you want to look at it. And Laura's research focuses on medieval manuscripts with her latest book, History Books in the Anglo-Norman World, examining the use of imagery in the communication of ideas about the past in the 12th and 13th centuries. At the moment, Laura is the principal investigator for the Cultivate Manuscripts Project, which is funded by the European Research Council and which examines the trade in pre-modern manuscripts between about 1900 and 1945 and its impact on the developments of scholarship and ideas about European identity. Having heard of a preliminary talk by Laura about this, I can testify to the fact that it's absolutely fascinating. But right now, we're going to listen to Laura talking about something different, which is medieval manuscripts and private presses, William Morris and his followers as collectors and creators of books from about 1891 to 1914. Thank you and over to you, Laura. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, hopefully everybody can now see some slides. Um, and I trust that, that Karen will, will correct me if that's not working. Um, it's a great pleasure to be giving this talk on a day of global events celebrating the Kelmscott Press and 125 years since the publication of the great collection of the works of Geoffrey Chaucer. As mm -hmm. Great. So, as Karen was saying, I am primarily somebody who works on medieval manuscripts, and I came to William Morris not as a great artist in his own right, really, or um, poet or socialist, but as somebody who produced, who created a collection of medieval manuscripts. One of, I think, what is uh, one of the things that is lesser known about him. Unlike early printed books, which Morris also collected, manuscripts are made by hand, meaning that each is unique. And before the invention of the printing press, this was the only means of producing books. So when Geoffrey Chaucer originally wrote his works, they were created by hand and copied by hand until they began to be printed in the middle of the 15th century. Manuscripts in the form of books, also known as codices, have been popular in Europe for about a thousand years before the development of the printing press in the middle of the 15th century and continued to be made even after printing became widespread. Although united by a shared technology, they were produced in a variety of sizes using different layouts, scripts and forms of decoration. Today I'm going to explore how these manuscripts as well as early printed books, helped to shape Morris's approach to bookmaking at the Kelmscott Press and that of his followers 
who founded presses including the Ashendean Press, the Doves Press and the Essex House Press. In a note on his aims in founding the Kelmscott Press, dated the 11th of November 1895, William Morris declared, I began printing books with the hope of producing some which would have a definite claim to beauty, while at the same time they should be easy to read and should not dazzle the eye or trouble the intellect of the reader by eccentricity of form in the letters. He went on, I have always been a great admirer of the calligraphy of the Middle Ages and of the earlier printing which took its place. Indeed, Morris had owned medieval manuscripts um, long before the foundation of the Kelmscott Press in 1891, and he had experimented with creating manuscripts from the 1850s. However, in the last five years of his life, from the foundation of the press until his death in October 1896, Morris built a library of over 100 medieval manuscripts. These, together with his collection of printed books, helped inform his ideas about the content, page layout, and decoration of the Kelmscott books, and he published a short essay on illuminated manuscripts in 1893. Moreover, Morris's acquisition of manuscripts and the creation and distribution of the Kelmscott books were facilitated by the same people, notably the rare book dealer Bernard Quaritch and the firm of bookbinders and dealers J and J Layton. My aim here is to examine the debt of some of the books produced by the Kelmscott Press and other private presses run by Morris's followers to medieval manuscripts and to explore the networks that supported both the acquisition of manuscripts and the creation of private press books from the foundation of the Kelmscott Press to the start of the First World War. In doing so, I've used the rich holdings of the University of London Library at Senate House, and I'm very grateful to the staff there for facilitating my access to those works. This talk is in three parts. The first will explore Morris as a collector of manuscripts. The second will examine how he drew on his experience of medieval manuscripts in the design of books for the Kemscott Press. And the third will address the impact of this work on later private press books. So part one, Morris as collector. Reporting on the sale of part of Morris's library in 1898, the London Daily News observed that it is not an everyday occurrence that a library dispersed at Sotheby's represents the tastes of a collector who was at once a distinguished poet, an artist, a socialist, a leading light in decorative production and a reviver of ancient topography, illumination and varied branches of book lore. The formation of Morris's library can be reconstructed from a series of catalogues together with his correspondence. A catalogue of his library produced in around 1876 included six medieval manuscripts, but by the time a second list of Morris's books was made in around 1890 to 1891, only two of those manuscripts, both Bibles, were still in the collection. The list of around 1890, which was begun by Morris's daughter Jenny and continued by Morris himself, also contained six manuscripts. In addition to the two Bibles, these were a 15th century Italian manuscript of Poggio Bracciolini's De Veritate Fortune, now in the Bodleian Library, which hopefully you can see on the left, and um, Paraldus's Summa De Vitis and Virtutibus, a collection of romances in French bought from J&J Layton in 1890, now in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, which should be on the screen on the right, and a list of abbeys and churches, etc. In both 1876 and 1890, manuscripts were exceptions in a library dominated by printed books. Yet with the foundation of the Kelmscott Press in 1891, Morris began to buy more manuscripts. Indeed, the Times later claimed that Mr. Morris was unquestionably a genuine bibliophile, but he accumulated the majority of his books with a definite purpose, to assist him in the highly laudable object of improving the art of topography. Morris's purchases were facilitated by, amongst others, the well-known London book dealer, Bernard Quaritch, who was advertising and distributing the Kelmscott books, and the firm J and J Layton, who were binding books for Morris. Between 1891 and 1896, 
Morris bought at least 29 manuscripts through Quaritch and 12 through Leighton. Some of these purchases were from the bookseller's stock, but Morris also placed commissions for, for items at auctions. The 1890s saw the dispersal of several large manuscript collections at auction, meaning that medieval manuscripts were readily available. In the first years of his serious collecting, Morris was careful about his expenditure, though still prepared to spend large sums on manuscripts. At an auction in May 1892, he left commission bids with Quaritch for three manuscripts and obtained a Bonaventure for £36, a Breviary for £195 and a Psalter for £112. £195 in 1892 would be about £21,000 today, but it's very difficult to make these kinds of assessments because you couldn't buy the Breviary um, that hopefully you're seeing here for anything like £21,000 today, even if it were available on the market. Um, so manuscript prices have increased disproportionately since then. The Breviary and the Psalter, both now in the Morgan Library in New York, were, as you can see, lavishly decorated books on parchment with images produced using gold and vibrant pigments. However, this comparison immediately introduces us to the variety of design found in medieval books, as the breviary has its text laid out in two columns and the slightly smaller Psalter uses just one. The two pages here both have the text of Psalm 1 with images of King David, the reputed author of the Psalms. But the decoration is done in very different styles. In the Psalter on the right, David is set inside the opening initial letter B, while in the breviary he's given a dedicated rectangular space above the smaller letter B. The differences in style also represent or reflect differences in, in slight differences in time period and in uh, place of production. While Morris was careful about expenditure on manuscripts in the early 1890s, in the final year of his life, his spending on manuscripts rose dramatically, and he paid Lord Aldenham at least a thousand pounds for the lavishly decorated windmill sorter now in the Morgan Library in New York. This page also contains the opening letter B of the Psalms, here done rather differently, packed with imagery showing the tree of Jesse um, outlining Christ's descent from David. This kind of decoration tests the boundaries between text and imagery, which I think was one of the reasons why it appealed to Morris. At the corners of the design are little roundels with the four gospel writers, further cementing the relationship between the Old Testament and the New, and showing what added imagery can do in terms of enriching a narrative, or changing the way that you think about a text. In 1896, Morris was diagnosed with tuberculosis, and his health declined rapidly. However, manuscripts such as the Windmill Salter continued to bring him great pleasure, and George Holford was persuaded to lend him three spectacular illuminated manuscripts, two more Psalter Hours and a, a Bible Historia. The comfort Morris found in manuscripts during his illness resonates with his aims for the Kelmscott Press, that books should have a definite claim to beauty while at the same time being easy to read and not dazzling the eye or troubling the intellect by too much eccentricity of form in the letters. All too soon, however, even books were too much, and Morris died on the 3rd of October 1896 at Kelmscott House in Hammersmith. His friend, the artist and dealer in manuscripts, Charles Fairfax Murray, produced a series of studies of the dead Morris, now finally at rest. Murray later thought about buying um, Morris's library, but the deal fell through. The creation of a substantial library of expensive rare books may seem like an odd activity for a famous socialist. In 1891, in an interview with the Pall Mall Gazette, Morris justified his private collection of early printed books on the grounds that if we were all socialists, things would be different. We should have a public library at each street corner where everybody might see and read all the best books printed in the best and most beautiful type. 
I should not then have to buy all these old books, but they would be common property and I could go and look at them whenever I wanted them, as would everybody else. Now I have to go to the British Museum, which is an excellent institution, but it is not enough. I want these books close at hand and frequently, and therefore I must buy them. His use of his purchases as creative inspiration for the Camscott Press may have helped Morris to further justify the expense, and he expected them to be sold to support his family after his death. Not all manuscripts were available to be bought, however. For example, the sole surviving copy of Beowulf, the famous early medieval poem, Morris's version of which was published by the Camscott Press in 1895, was in the British Museum, where Morris might have seen it. And we'll come back to that book later on. Morris provided some insights into his study of his manuscripts in an article published in the Magazine of Art in 1893, entitled Some Notes on the Illuminated Books of the Middle Ages. Despite the title, Morris began by focusing on text, declaring that the Middle Ages may be called the epoch of writing par excellence. Morris offered a brief overview of the development of manuscripts, beginning in Byzantium before moving to early medieval work in Ireland and Britain, and then turning to the 13th century. He claimed that the last quarter of the 13th century was the pinnacle of book illumination, arguing that nothing can exceed the grace, elegance, and beauty of the drawing and the loveliness of the color found at this period in the best executed books. Morris's collection was rich in lavishly decorated 13th century manuscripts, and these were among the books he used to illustrate the essay. Indeed, I think all the illustrations in the essay came from Morris's collection, and they also included the breviary we saw earlier, but was in 1892. Morris concluded his essay by considering the transition from manuscript to print in the 15th century. He noted that manuscripts continued to be produced after the advent of printing, but discerned a divorce in these books between the picture work and the ornament. He clarified, often the pictures are exquisitely finished miniatures belonging to the best schools of painting of the day, but often also they are clearly the work of men employed to fill up a space and having no interest in their work save livelihood. The ornament never fell quite so low as that, though as ornament it is not very distinguished. And often in the latest books scarcely adds to the effect on the page of the miniature to which it is subsidiary. This finds a parallel in the way in which Morris organised the work of the Camscott Press, for which he employed other artists, but kept a, work, a close eye on the work of all those involved to ensure high standards and the harmony of all the elements on the page. The main examples of this disjunction between ornament and imagery in some medieval books, Morris noted, were to be found in books of hours, the hugely popular prayer books produced in vast numbers from the 13th century onwards. And he avoided collecting examples of late medieval books of hours, even though these were readily and cheaply available on the private market. As I hope has been evident from this very small sample of the manuscripts owned by Morris, his collection was diverse. Not all of his books were in excellent condition. Some had been made using cheap parchment and others had been damaged by use or neglect. Most were decorated either with figurative imagery or elaborate penwork, as in the case of this 13th century Bible now in Boston that Morris owned and had used in his 1893 article. The diverse collection provided Morris with rich source material for the design of books, their text and decoration, as he was working for the Camscott Press. The first three publications of the Camscott Press were not obviously inspired by the Middle Ages. However, the fourth production in 1892 turned to Morris's and his, long, his circle's long-standing interest in the medieval. This was a chapter of John Ruskin's The Stones of Venice on the nature of Gothic, in which Ruskin set out to give the reader an idea at once broad and definite of the true nature of Gothic architecture. Ruskin was also a collector of medieval manuscripts, although he is perhaps best known now for his enthusiasm for cutting up these books, breaking them down into the different elements of the page in a disturbingly literal manner. 
Morris was also interested in medieval buildings as well as books, and in 1893 the Kelmscott Press printed his 1889 lecture for the Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society on Gothic Architecture. His essay opens by distinguishing architecture from mere building, declaring a true architectural work rather is a building duly provided with all necessary furniture, decorated with all due ornament, according to the use, quality and dignity of the building. So looked on, a work of architecture is a harmonious cooperative work of art, inclusive of all the serious arts, all those which are not engaged in the production of mere toys or of ephemeral prettinesses. This idea of integrated and harmonious production was applied by Morris to all his endeavours, including the Kelmscott books. Moreover, Morris's account of the development of medieval architecture has striking parallels with his account of illuminated manuscripts published the same year, tracing a development in architecture from Byzantium to England and Germany before spreading throughout Europe. Similarly, what Morris sees as the decline of architecture at the end of the Middle Ages is linked to a shift from production by artists, artist craftsmen to human machines working to survive rather than driven by beauty and creativity. Intriguingly, the essay on architecture opens with an initial B that bears a passing resemblance to initials in some of Morris's medieval books, including that in the breviary bought in 1892. Although unlike the manuscript initial, it's confined to a square block. Morris's ideas about socialism, the Middle Ages and art and architecture were by the 1890s closely intertwined and found expression in his Kelmscott publications. The production of Ruskin's work in 1892 was followed by another new edition of an established text, this time a volume of Morris's poetry entitled The Defence of Guinevere and Other Poems, first published in 1858 and Morris's first book. A letter of January 1892 indicates that at that time Morris was full of ideas for the press, inspired both by early printed books and manuscripts. He declared, I'm going to reprint the first book printed in English, the Requois or Goderings of the Histories of Troy, which Caxton translated from the French of Raoul Lefebvre. It's a curious collection of Greco-Roman mythology as understood in the Middle Ages. He added, I'm preparing to print Chaucer also and the English Gesta Romanorum, a very beautiful book of a manuscript of the early 15th century, English of the best period. I am also egotist enough to intend printing my own works a good deal. The next that comes out will be my earliest volume, The Defence of Guinevere. Morris had long been interested in the legends of King Arthur, his Queen Guinevere and the Knights of the Round Table. And Guinevere had appeared in his art as well as his poetry. For example, in this wall hanging designed by Morris and executed by his wife Jane around 1860, now at Kelmscott Manor. The volume of poems, printed by the Kelmscott Press in 300 paper and 12 parchment copies, was the first of the Kelmscott books to be bound in limp vellum, imitating a medieval book, with Guinevere written by hand on the spine. The binding was done by Leighton. Yet despite its binding and Arthurian subject matter, the book's internal appearance owes little directly to medieval manuscripts. It was set in golden type with new poems and sections marked with engraved initials of different sizes and headings printed in red. This structuring of the text has its roots in medieval books, but was also common in early printed ones. Moreover, although the decoration includes vines, uh, which you can see in the initial to the poem on King Arthur's tomb on the lower right there, and these were apparently inspired by a trip to Bordeaux where Morris also bought more manuscripts. And these designs have uh, a sort of swirling pattern to them, not unlike the um, design we encountered in one of Morris's medieval manuscripts earlier on. The designs are restricted to the form of their blocks and of course lack the vibrancy uh, of the colour of many, many medieval books. Overall, therefore, both the text's content and form 
owe a debt to medieval books. But the decoration of Guinevere is distinctively Kelmscott. And the final page proclaims the importance of the press and William Morris in both the colophon and the decorative design. The early Kelmscott books were distributed by Reeves and Turner, but in November 1892, Quaritch acted as the publisher for the first in a series of books based on the work of the early printer, William Caxton. These were the Golden Legend, for which the Golden Type was named, the History of Troy, mentioned by Morris in his letter in January, for which the Troy Type was named, and the History of Reynard the Fox. The arrangement was that Quaritch supplied the materials selected by Morris and paid for the costs of the printing and binding, recouping the money from the sale of the books. Quaritch was to have served a similar role in distributing the Great Chaucer project, but after a disagreement about costs, Morris decided to handle this himself. Despite their disagreement, however, Morris continued to buy manuscripts from Quaritch. Another person involved with the Kelmscott Press also bridged the divide between creating books and selling them. This was Morris's friend and later one of his executors, Frederick Ellis. In 1860, Ellis had started his bookshop in Covent Garden, later moving to New Bond Street. By the time of the Kelmscott Press, Ellis had retired, but his firm was continued by his nephew, and Morris obtained at least four manuscripts from them. Ellis is credited as the editor of the text for the Kelmscott Golden Legend and many other Kelmscott productions. The credit for the Kelmscott translation of Beowulf, published in February 1895, was given to William Morris and the Cambridge scholar Alfred John Wyatt. In 1892, Morris wrote to Wyatt of his hope to tackle Beowulf, which no one can appreciate in present versions, I think. Morris recognised that the main challenge was translating the text from Old English to modern, adding, I intend to try it if I can get anyone to help me who knows Anglo-Saxon, as I do not, and who could also set me right as to the text and its grievous gaps. Wyatt produced a paraphrase of the text, which Morris then rendered into verse. Yet although the text traced its origin to a single manuscript, now in the British Library, once again, the Kelmscott book owed little to the appearance of medieval books, let alone the Beowulf manuscript. Like Guinevere, the book was bound in limp vellum, though this time the title was stamped in gold on the spine. 300 copies, of which this is one, were printed on paper and eight on parchment. Troy type was chosen for the text. After an introduction setting out the argument, the story begins with a title page in the familiar Kelmscott style, facing the start of the text proper, which is also given a full border of foliate decoration. The overall impact of this is not unlike the densely woven design of the Windmill Psalter, but it is very unlike the Beowulf manuscript. If we, with the use of technology, put the Kelmscott, Beowulf and the original manuscript side by side, the contrast is, I think, striking. The manuscript was damaged in the Ouch Burnham House Fire in 1731, causing it to shrink and damaging the edges of the pages. This provides a dramatic contrast to the elaborate frame given to the first page and the Kelmscott copy, although that, that border with its swirling foliage is only on these opening pages. While both versions begin with an elaborate decorated le first letter, and we have the first word or words in the case of the manuscript in majuscule type, so larger even type in this case, um, they are still pretty different, the, um, the Morris version being much more elaborate than the manuscripts. Similarly, if we consider a sample from later in the work, both versions are divided into sections with the use of Roman numerals, and each section begins with a larger initial. 
but the Kelmscott version adds decorative borders of vines or flowers and short introductions to each section of the text in red, helping the reader navigate the text as well as making the overall appearance rather more aesthetically pleasing. Once again, the book ends with a text explaining how it came to be created and a large Kelmscott design, ensuring that no reader could miss its status as a Kelmscott product. Yet if the Kelmscott Beowulf was a distant relation of the manuscript in the British Museum, other Kelmscott books were based directly on manuscripts owned by Morris and his friends. In 1894, the press issued Sami Penitentiales, a, an English rhymed version of the Seven Penitential Psalms edited by F.S. Ellis, which was printed in 300 paper and 12 parchment copy. A list of the Kelmscott books compiled by Morris's secretary, Sidney Cockrell, noted that these verses were taken from a manuscript book of ours written at Gloucester in the first half of the 15th century. That manuscript, which Morris had acquired from Quaritch, is now in the Morgan Library in New York. Now, unfortunately, I haven't been able to get photos of the exact section of this manuscript that corresponds with the Kelmscott book. Um, but I'm showing you instead a different page from the relevant manuscript. While the Kelmscott version is in Chaucer type, the type designed for Morris's great Chaucer collection, finally published in 1896, making it more readily legible than the Gothic bookhand of the manuscript, a comparison with one of the decorated pages um, photographed by the Morgan Library suggests that the choice of the border and the initial decorations may have been informed by the soft curves of the manuscript's decoration. So here we've still got an initial letter that's defined by a square, although the second one below is starting to play with the idea that you, you might not have to use the whole of the regular block, and you could instead suggest a softer edging. And we've got cho forms chosen in this foliage that, that curve um, and are quite lush in the same way that the, the manuscript has these, these uh, rather dense um, curling leaves. So it's possible, I think, that they, they chose their designs having an awareness of the manuscript. The Kelmscott book again uses red ink for parts of its text and it may have followed the manuscript in this. The following year, a second book entitled Laudes Beate Mariae Virginis, or Praise of the Blessed Virgin Mary, was published with a note dated December the 28th, observing that the Reverend E.S. Dewick, another collector of manuscripts, had pointed out that these poems were printed in 1579 when they were attributed to Stephen Langton. However, the note makes clear that the Kelmscott version was produced not from this printed book, but from a manuscript, probably written before his, that is Langton's death in 1228. The manuscript seems to have been another one in Morris's collection, now also in the Morgan Library in New York. The contents of the printed version matches very closely the catalogue description of the Morgan manuscript but again unfortunately I haven't got photographs of the relevant pages for you. Nevertheless I've got some some photographs of a different section of the same book which again can are suggestive in terms of the potential influence of the manuscript when choosing the decorative features of the printed book. The selection of the border decorations and the engraved initials for the Kelmscott book seems to be sympathetic to the twisting vines found in the manuscript's decoration, if not an attempt to exactly reproduce the manuscript's decoration, which also includes charming dragons and monsters. This book was printed in Troy type, yet again making it rather clearer to read than the Gothic book hand of the manuscript. Yet the Kelmscott book has a particular innovation because for the first time it uses blue for some of its initial letters. 
And this is reminiscent of the alternating use of red and blue penwork initials in the manuscript. The University of London's library's copy, which is what you're seeing here on the right, is on paper. But the evocation of a manuscript might have been even greater in the copies on parchment. Although it's worth noting that some early printed books were printed on parchment and some manuscripts were written on paper. So the choice of material does not exclusively evoke one or other technology. Before we leave the Kelmscott books, it's worth coming back briefly to the book that we're celebrating today, the Kelmscott Chaucer, probably the most famous Kelmscott book, published 125 years ago. Once again, this was edited by Frederick Ellis, but it had woodcut illustrations by Edward Byrne Jones. In the late 19th century, Chaucer's work was valued as an important witness to early poetry in English, and in the case of the Canterbury Tales, the first substantial text to be printed by William Caxton in 1476. The use of the title, The Works of Geoffrey Chaucer, now newly imprinted in the Camscott book, hints at the importance of the printed tradition, and early printed copies often sold for higher prices than manuscript ones. In a letter to Quaritch in 1892, Morris referred to the exceptional status of this production. Because of the Byrne Jones illustrations, it was more than just a new copy of an old text, and Morris thought it would appeal to people who would not care at all for my type of ornaments or for Chaucer either. Nevertheless, as you can see, Morris's ornaments were also prominent, and the book is once again a distinctively Kelmscott product. The first printed books, including Caxton's Chaucer, were modelled on medieval manuscripts as the only books that printers knew. In collecting both manuscripts and early printed books, Morris gave himself a wide range of material to draw on in the design of books for the Kelmscott Press. Some were more directly inspired by medieval manuscripts than others, drawing on them for their text, decoration and overall appearance. In the process, Morris, like Chaucer, faced the problem of how to reproduce works um, made, sorry, like Caxton, faced the problem of how to reproduce works made in one technology using another. Although the ornament became less defined by rectangular blocks and the press began to experiment with more colour, the results were always going to be part of a tradition of printing. At the same time, the Kelmscott Press developed its own distinctive style, creating books that are now easily recognisable. The press continued beyond Morris's death, completing projects begun by Morris, but it was closed in 1898. Morris had intended to design a range of bindings for the Chaucer, but the only one that he completed was produced by the Doves Bindery, run by T.J. Cobden Sanderson. After Morris's death, Cobden Sanderson, together with Emery Walker, who had played a major role in the Kelmscott Press, founded the Doves Press. This was just one of the private presses that attempted to develop the Kelmscott legacy created by members of Morris's circle. Another press inspired by Kelmscott was the Ashendine Press, founded by Charles St. John Hornby, another collector of medieval manuscripts. In 1898, the Ashenden Press also produced a version of a work by Chaucer, that unlike the enormous Kelmscott volume, their production was reduced to the prologue of the Canterbury Tales. The book has a stamp showing printers at work with Hornby's name and the motto, Les hommes sont méchants, mais le livre sont bon. Men are wicked, but their books are good. The cover of the Ashenden Chaucer proclaims its focus on type, with each letter isolated, forcing the reader to contemplate them as letters in the process of their search for words. Inside, a note to the gentle reader explains that the text is that of a new edition by Dr. Skeet, illustrated with facsimiles of images from Caxton's second edition of the tales. It also states that the type used is cast from the matrices given in about the year 1670 by Bishop Fell to the University of Oxford. The emphasis, therefore, is on the tradition of printing in England going back to Caxton. Yet Hornby, like Morris, was interested in manuscripts as well as printed books, and in the early 20th century he began to build his own collection. 
He even came to own some of the manuscripts that had been in Morris's collection, including this 12th century New Testament now in the Getty Museum in California, as well as manuscripts that had been owned by Ruskin. As his collection of manuscripts and early printed books grew, Hornby came into contact with other collectors and he was admitted to the elite Roxburgh Club in 1911. As with Morris, it seems that manuscripts as well as early printed books may have informed some of the productions of the Ashton Dean Press. In 1913, the press turned to a subject of medieval origin, producing a version of Mallory's Mort Darfa. The advertisement for the book declared that the text was a reprint of Caxton's edition of 1485 with modern punctuation. Mallory's text survives in only one known manuscript and only two copies of Caxton's printed version are known. Neither version contains illustrations, but the press opted to add woodcuts by brother and sister Charles and Margaret Gere, who'd also illustrated books for the Kelscott Press. This, together with the decision to add red and blue initials, makes the Ashton Dean book rather more evocative of a medieval manuscript. In particular, the decision to use rectangular images that span the width of the text block is reminiscent of the manuscript containing the story of Lancelot, which had been bought by the British collector Henry Yates Thompson, another member of the Roxburgh Club, from Charles Fairfax Murray in 1905. That sale had been arranged by Morris's former aide, Sidney Cockrell. The images in the Ashton Dean Mort Dartha are not copied from the Lancelot manuscript, nor do they follow the manuscript's example in using the wide space to incorporate multiple incidents in a single image. However, while the gears create a much greater sense of depth, in places they also evoke the idea of figures in a single plane with the use of um, figures and particularly animals in profile. Although these images both include figures lying under a tree, therefore I want you to look actually at the, the horses in profile and the way that in the printed image, most of the figures are grouped on a single plane, suggesting a very flat um, image, not unlike the medieval version. Moreover, before we entirely write off the medieval artist's interest in three-dimensional space, Note that the leg of the wounded knight protrudes over the frame into the viewer's space. Similarly, although the modern artists opted to depict almost all the elements in their images to scale, unlike the medieval artists, the use of walls and bits of crenellated walls and doorways to suggest the chapel perilous finds a parallel in the manuscripts art artists' attempt to render architecture through that same focus on walls and doors. The Ashton Dean Press demonstrates the extent to which a small network of people connected many of the private presses in the generation after Kelmscott. In 1900, Sidney Cockrell, who would amass an important collection of medieval manuscripts in his own right, introduced St. John Hornby to Emery Walker, who had advised Morris on type for the Kelmscott Press and was Cobden Sanderson's partner in the Doves Press. Walker provided valuable advice to Hornby on the Ashton Dean Press. Casting the net a little wider, the binding of the Mort Dartha was designed by Doug Royce Cockrell, brother of Sydney. In 1901, Hornby hired Florence, known as Kate Kingsford, to illuminate the Ashton Dean Press's Song of Songs, which was printed on vellum, paying her five guineas a copy. Hornby's own copy is now in the Bridwell Library, and this is what you have here. The densely packed borders are reminiscent of Morris's Kelmscott books, though here they've been printed by hand, privileging the manuscript over the printed. Kate Kingsford was also employed by the Essex House Press, run by Charles Robert Ashby, who bought the Kelmscott printed in presses and employed many of the staff in his new venture. In 1907, Kate married Sidney Cockrell, and her sister Joan was later employed as the librarian for another collector of manuscripts, Alfred Chester Beattie. In 1908, Cockrell became director of the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. He played an important part in continuing to promote Morris's legacy and facilitating the creation and study of collections of manuscripts, as well as promoting his wife's work. 
At Christmas 1922, Cockrell sent this design by Morris for one of the woodcut initials used at Camscott to Eric G. Miller, who was then working for the Department of Manuscripts at the British Museum, and also had begun a collection of medieval manuscripts um, in his own private capacity. Cockrell's actions and the activities of the presses inspired by Kelmscott thus ensured that Morris's ideas about both medieval manuscripts and modern book design continued to be influential well into the 20th century. In conclusion then, as the London Daily News captured in its account of the sale of part of Morris's library at auction in 1898, Morris was remarkable as a poet, artist, socialist, producer of books and collector. All of these elements came together in the final years of his life in the creation of books with the Kelmscott Press. His private collection of medieval manuscripts brought him great pleasure and helped to inform his approach to creating Kelmscott books. He drew upon items in his collection, as well as in collections such as the British Museum, for the text, layout and ornamentation of Kelmscott books. In the process, he and his team had to wrestle with how to transpose ideas from one technology into another. The medieval manuscripts were, of course, not his only source, and he also collected and studied printed books in creating the distinctive Camscott type and decoration. Both the creation of the Camscott books and the construction of his library were facilitated by a close-knit network of supporters, including Quaritch and Leighton. Similarly, after Morris's death, the legacy of the press was continued by those who had been close to Morris as they worked with new presses and continued to collect manuscripts. Morris's collection of manuscripts and the Kelmscott books are now spread around the world, where they continue to provide inspiration for new generations of readers, scholars, designers and artists. And there I will leave it. Thank you.